Hello, and thank you for joining our panel today, The Right to Be Human in the Age of AI. Uh, my name is Anna Zaza, and I'll be your moderator for today's panel, uh, which is held together in part with the Institute Novum, with the European Liberal Forum, and the Institute of Politics and Society. Uh, this event is also part of a wider project, Human Rights in the 21st Century. Uh, we'll begin today's event with a welcome speech from Dr. Sarka Pratt, Board of Directors of the European Liberal Forum and Director of the Institute of Politics and Society. Mr. Sarka. Thank you, Anas. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to welcome you to this online roundtable regarding human rights in the 21st century with the very catchy title, Right to be Human in the Age of AI. I am welcoming you on behalf of the European Liberal Forum. My name is Sharka Prat and I'm an elected board member of the European Liberal Forum and executive director of the Czech think tank, the Institute for Politics and Society. Despite the fact that you are connected with us online rather than discussing in person, we are nevertheless glad that you were able to join us. The European Liberal Forum brings together liberally oriented think tanks, institutions and foundations from all over Europe and beyond. Together, we are creating a space for dialogue on European integration, liberal policies, ideas, and above all else, human rights and artificial intelligence. Discussions on such topics should be encouraged in the face of current conditions and the rapidly evolving technology. The year 2020 is marked by the global pandemic, COVID-19 bringing with its social, economic, and political troubles. Most every country in the world was affected one way or another. Today, we would like to discuss the situation of human rights in the 21st century and technology and debate the status of our basic freedoms and subsequent infringement of those rights in the aftermath of the pandemic. ELF reflects the EU's approach to AI and human rights by supporting regulation regarding data mining and privacy. The EU has an added challenge moving forward, however, of balancing between protecting the rights to privacy of millions of citizens and also remaining competitive with the rest of the world. AI systems continue to impact society and citizens and it is the role of governments and institutions to keep human rights at the center of technological advances. We at ELF believe that respecting human rights is the first step in creating a more open and liberal Europe. The EU must continue to do its part in abiding by the treaties and conventions it ratifies. ELF will continue to strive for maintaining our basic freedoms by conducting and hosting forums on human rights in hopes that we can learn from each other. On behalf of the European Liberal Forum, I wish you a pleasant debate and I firmly believe that the fruitful discussion which we are so accustomed to during our events will be reflected in virtual form. Thank you, Sharga. And now a welcome speech from our managing director, Sebastian Pickle from the Institute Novum. Mr. Sebastian. Sorry, I had to unmute it. Uh, hello from my side. My name is Sebastian Pickle from uh, Institute Novum. I'm a managing director. Um, and uh, yes, uh, there, this is now a third event in the context of uh, our larger project, Human Rights in 21st Century, first two being Human Rights and uh, Senior Citizens, and the uh, second one was Human Rights and Rule of Law. I believe that we are uh, tackling uh, extremely contemporary topics, uh, and uh, this one, uh, Human Rights and Artificial Intelligence, is definitely one of those. Um, just to say a few words about the project itself. Um, so the project idea for the human rights in 21st century was carefully prepared by European Liberal Forum, Institute Novum, and uh, several other political foundations across Europe last year. And we believe that human rights are one of the cornerstones of European integration and one of its fundamental values. 
and human rights are being challenged uh, by a complex issues deriving out of technological progress, um, geostrategic interests and climate change. And as it was already mentioned, to add a recent global challenge on public health, uh, which is a coronavirus disease and uh, coronavirus disease definitely has an impact on human rights as well. So this third event, uh, as mentioned, is going to focus on human rights and artificial intelligence. I think, as I said, it's in extremely important topics, topics since uh, artificial intelligence can be, how should I put it, a curse uh, or a bless for society in large. And uh, dialogue, communication, and discussions is what we need to understand how uh, artificial intelligence should be developed to promote and expand human rights, how to promote and expand freedom and human progress. So thanks to Sharka, Prat and Anna Saza uh, for the effort and for uh, flawless preparation uh, of the event. So thank you all as well to participate in the event and uh, I am looking forward uh, to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Andy, there at this question. All right, and now to introduce our guests. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Ann Bowser, who is a deputy director with Science Technology Innovation Program and director of innovation at the Wilson Center. Her work investigates the intersections between science, technology, and democracy, um, who will also be giving a US perspective today on AI and ethics. Our second speaker is Theresa Harris, is a project director in the Scientific Responsibility Human Rights Law Program at the American Association for Advancement of Science. She manages the program's projects on science and human rights, including volunteer referral service that provides technical support for human rights organizations, the Science and Human Rights Coalition Network of Scientific Associations and Societies, as well as the activities that promote greater understanding of human rights to science. She will focus on how human rights and how the right to enjoy the benefit of scientific progress and its applications should inform our understanding on human rights and concerns. Our third speaker is Dr. Stefan Larson, who is a senior lecturer and associate professor in technology and social change at Lund University in Sweden, Department of Technology and Society. He is also a lawyer and a social legal researcher that holds a PhD in sociology of law, as well as a PhD in spatial planning. His multidisciplinary research focuses on issues of trust, transparency on digital, data-driven markets, and the social legal impacts of autonomous and AI-driven technologies. Today, he will be speaking briefly about ethics guidelines as a tool for AI governance and the surge of ethics guidelines in, in, the, in themselves, as well as anthology of how EU encourages the member states to follow EU politics policies. We will then be followed by our fourth speaker, Dr. Mahmoud Shahid Saliqi, who's joining us from India, who is a media and development professional in skills and knowledge in digital media and social development. He's also a campaigner for human rights and added to his work as a journalist. As a campaigner for human rights and peace, Dr. Shahid has worked with both the government and private sectors to push, his, to push for his belief in sustainable development. Today, he'll be discussing good or bad AI. Could the development of new applications be threats to human rights? And our final speaker, is Doman Savage, the director of the NGO Citizen D, Slovenia, where he, is, where he focuses on developing long-term projects related to digital rights, communication privacy, digital security, media regulation, and active citizen participation in the political sphere. Well, he recovered today COVID-19 apps between a rock and a hard place. Now, we'll get the floor over to Dr. Ann Bowser, please. Good morning, good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Can everybody see my screen just to confirm? Negative, just one second. It's possible that Stefan has to stop sharing his briefly. If you could do that, Stefan, please. Of course. There you go. Are we good? You can see. Yeah, I can see it now. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you again for inviting me to attend this event. It's always interesting to be an American at European convenings, especially now, 
we look to Europe for a lot of leadership, especially from an ethical perspective in the data governance space, which is of course very closely related to AI. But we also recognize the value of Western democracy and the need to collaborate with our strategic allies, especially around safe and equitable R&D for artificial intelligence and machine learning. So just a bit about my background. I'm tuning in from Washington, DC. I'm from the Wilson Center. We are another think tank. We're a quasi government think tank. And while we are primarily interested in foreign policy, we also have a science and technology innovation program that looks at cross cutting s and issues of global relevance, including artificial intelligence. Within this program, one of our flagships is a congressional artificial or a congressional technology lab series where the Wilson Center convenes members from both sides of the aisle, as well as senior staffers together for six weeks of education into the deep science and technology issues of the day. We started out with cybersecurity and we've been doing artificial intelligence for about three years right now. And in addition to helping orchestrate the program, I am lucky enough to get to teach the session on bias, which is one of my favorite projects. And then in addition to our engagement through the AI labs, we also have a small but growing research program called Beyond Bands, which specifically analyzes facial recognition technologies um, and advocates for holistic frameworks rather than sort of reactionary measures. So today I'm going to be talking about bias in general, but also a focus on facial recognition, which is a really key public policy issue in the US, especially right now, and then also related topics. So looking at bias and machine learning, I always start the congressional labs with reminding people that bias is actually a concept that's rooted in cognitive and evolutionary psychology. So at some point in the evolution of humans, it became advantageous for people to be able to make decisions very quickly and with limited information. So when we started designing artificial intelligence and especially machine learning systems, we often look to the human brain as a model and wound up designing the same shortcuts into automated systems that are present in the human brain. So what's common is the need to extrapolate on incomplete data to make a decision. So when you think about bias, I find this taxonomy helpful. It was something that began to be published during the Obama administration in this particular format, but of course is much more broadly relevant than that. Two major sources of bias are data bias. So most people at this point are aware that data used for training algorithms is flawed in a number of ways. Sometimes developers just make poor decisions in terms of selection because of their limited knowledge or because some data is proprietary and closed. Data are often incomplete or incorrect. And then even if you look at user-centered data or information that people opt into sharing, the types of people that are more likely to share their information are different than the people that won't and that creates biases as well. In addition, and this is a point that's often missed, we have sources of algorithmic bias. So certain AI systems like recommender systems, this is everything from a search engine to something that tells you what movies to, to look at on Netflix, are deliberately designed to narrow rather than expand whatever a user is interested in. So this is already because of the particular design of the system, shaping it to be reductionist and present less rather than more information. And as AI becomes progressively more sophisticated, these two sources of bias interact, especially in machine learning systems. And this creates sort of a self-enforcing vicious cycle where systems become really biased really quickly, as well as potentially having other ethical flaws. And it can be really hard to move backwards, if not impossible, or even to entangle where bias comes from. So many people think of this as a wicked problem, and it obviously has very strong ethical and social ramifications. So to make this a little bit more concrete, beginning in 2018, MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, which is a top tier university in the United States that often serves as a, as a watchdog for emerging technologies, published a study called Gender Shades. 
And what Gender Shades did was it looked across a couple major facial recognition systems, including one from Amazon, one from IBM, and one from Microsoft, I believe, to see how well they performed in regards to things like demographic differences. So this is um, anything from gender to race to age. And they didn't find anything that was particularly encouraging, but they sort of picked on Amazon. And specifically, some of the worst findings from the study were that Amazon's facial recognition system, which is called recognition, mistakenly identified pictures of women as men 19% of the time, darker skinned women as men 31% of the time, and then also had additional issues related to gender and age. So the 31% is really concerning in terms of performance, but also this study highlighted the concept of intersectionality, which basically says that different aspects of a person's identity, like gender and race, can stack and can create problems that are exponentially more difficult to deal with than a single variable alone. There were some methodological issues, as Amazon, as well as others, pointed out, uh, for example, convoluting facial uh, recognition, which is designed to identify a specific individual with facial analysis. But this was still a really important piece of research because it shone a spotlight very early on on these important issues. I thought Amazon's response was really interesting and actually pretty good for a private sector company. They, of course, released a statement poking at some of the methodological issues, but then they also issued a much stronger response around the desire to cooperate with government, um, saying that Amazon Web Service encourages and supports the development of independent standards for facial recognition by entities like NIST. And then also will work with international research organizations and standards bodies to develop tests that support better cloud-based facial recognition. And then in addition, and I've never seen this before, Amazon collaborated with the National Science Foundation, which is the primary funder of scientific research in the United States, to launch a joint program on fairness in artificial intelligence. And Amazon actually put up a significant portion of the funding for this research but left the peer review to NSF in order to ensure that anything that came out of this funding call was objective and impartial and not influenced by Amazon's wishes. So the next year, 2009, NIST, which is the National Institute of Standards and Technology, this is a very scientific agency. There's a physical laboratory component as well as non-regulatory government uh, mandates did a follow-on study on demographic effects. And this is interesting because it, it was an evolution of something that NIST started doing around 2013. And they didn't come right out, they, they mentioned gender shades in the study as sort of part of the rationale or impetus. They, they don't say that they're trying to do a better job from a methodological perspective, but I really think they did. They came up with similar findings that were a lot more detailed and then also looked across more platforms from a tech perspective. And again, they found that false positive identifications are highest in West African, East African, and East Asian populations, slightly higher in Central Americans, unsurprisingly lowest in Western Europeans. And then they found additional differences for gender with 2.5, or, or sorry, two to five times higher misidentifications for women as well as age. So this is really reaffirming, first of all, that we do have significant biases in facial recognition across the board, but also that it's not just isolated to one demographic effect, but is actually true for multiple demographic effects. The devil's always in the details. I just wanna highlight a couple things about this research. NIST found that false positives, meaning saying that you have an identification when one doesn't actually exist, are higher than false negatives. Facial recognition is used in a lot of ways. The use case I gave was uh, centered around law enforcement, but it can also be used for, you know, for example, users to authenticate their cell phones. False positives are okay for authentication, but they're really, really, really bad for civil rights concerns. NIST also found significant gains between 2013 and 2018. The 2013 numbers were just absolutely terrible. And part of these gains came from a new technology development called convolutional neural networks, 
which is sort of illustrated by the photo in the middle of the slide. And CNNs are modeled directly after how neurons work in the human brain. It's really sophisticated. Uh, cutting edge technology in AI, but it's still prone to error and it's prone to a very specific type of error, which is called uh, overfitting. In other words, it's inherently more likely to identify uh, relationships where they don't exist than to make the other type of error. So this really shows to me that technology is not going to be a silver bullet. And despite the best advances that we can muster from that perspective, you still need policy and ethical solutions as well as technological ones to be able to contend with some of these issues. So zooming out, um, facial recognition um, for the use of policing is a huge issue, but it's not really the only one, even within criminal justice. A related issue that's been going on for decades is bias and recidivism. Recidivism refers to the likelihood that a criminal who is convicted of a crime will go on to make a second crime. And it's used in decisions around things like whether or not an individual is granted parole. So this slide shows the results of a study that was published by the watchdog ProPublica that looked at a parole decision support system with two individuals, Risha Borden on the right is 18. She steals a bike for $80, has a small history of juvenile misdemeanors. Vernon Prater on the left shoplifts tools. Again, same value, $80, but has a very strong history of armed robbery, attempted armed robbery, more armed robbery, and has actually served five years in prison. And if you look at these pictures, the obvious uh, reason that Brisha would be awarded a high risk rating of eight, where Vernon was awarded a low risk rating of three would be race. And it's not necessarily that these algorithms are looking at race up front. A lot of its proxy variables like a neighborhood, um, for example, zip codes are correlated with racial identity in the United States. But this also builds on decades of systematic racism in the US where, for example, minority neighborhoods are patrolled more often and to greater degrees than non-minority neighborhoods. So this is reflecting broader systems issues. And the point that I wanna make here is that this is data bias coming from both legitimate social reasons as well as probably other reasons as well. And it inhibits fairness directly but also challenges broader demographic and democratic values, including the rule of law. So just quickly, just as um, facial recognition isn't the only problem in criminal justice, bias isn't the only problem in facial recognition. I know that this is already very well known in European circles, but we are starting over here to think about privacy as an equally significant concern. So this happened beginning in fall of 2020 when the Customs and Border Patrol reported a data breach related to their facial recognition data. This is very sensitive data. They're now working with NIST and other agencies on developing more secure systems, but it's still an issue that raised awareness of concerns. Another resource is a project called the Perpetual Lineup, which comes out of Georgetown University. And this looks at the patchwork quilt of laws in, in US states that are regulating facial recognition. And it also looks at the sources that images used for training data are coming from. So it's pretty standard if you're developing a system for criminal justice to use databases like mugshots of already convicted criminals. But this study demonstrates that some states are also pulling from DMV records, meaning that anybody with a driver's license is having their photo used in some of these facial recognition systems. And then lastly, one lawsuit that's notable happened in the state of Illinois. It's called Patel versus Facebook. This was a class action lawsuit against Facebook's facial recognition. It actually settled out of court for 500 million. And the judge determined that privacy violations are inherent in facial recognition technologies. So it didn't actually matter about the specific use. So just to finish up quickly, I don't like to present problems without solutions. How do we deal with bias in AI? It's complicated. Uh, short term is identification and very simple mitigation. So the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States was really helpful for raising awareness of these issues and still is. A lot of um, 
legislation that we're seeing in this area is around just banning facial recognition technology. I think that's potentially helpful as a short-term solution, but I would caution against using too much of it. We also had three companies, including IBM, Microsoft, and Amazon chime in and uh, volunteer to stop using facial recognition for law enforcement or selling to law enforcement for some time frame between one year and indefinitely. In the midterm, there are various technology and policy solutions that have been proposed. I think the most interesting ones are algorithmic impact assessments. These are frameworks for government agencies to think through the ethical issues of AI that would be leveraged for facial recognition, as well as other systems. New Zealand has already piloted this across 14 federal agencies, and Canada has an open source tool that they're making available for anyone who wants to use it. Technical architectures can also be helpful for making sure that humans are kept in the loop. Uh, all intermediate and long-term solutions do require both technological and policy solutions, which is often something that people forget. And then lastly, in the long-term, I think what's really needed to, to preserve human rights and artificial intelligence is big picture frameworks. So we have a lot of principles, including the OECD, and then also in the United States, the White House has issued some draft principles, the Department of Defense has as well. These are great for being normative guiding priorities, but they're extremely high level. Slightly more concrete is definitions. If you can't measure something, you can't manage it. So defining a key concept like transparency is really important for ensuring ethical development of these technologies. And then getting progressively more concrete standards, especially developed um, on the international stage, and then concrete requirements for systems. So I think that's my initial thoughts on the US perspective, and I look forward to hearing what's happening elsewhere. Thank you, Dr. Ann. And we also have from the US also is uh, Theresa Harris. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, holding this important conversation today and for inviting me to be part of it. Uh, let me start with an introduction to the American Association for the Advancement of Science, or AAAS for short. We are the world's largest general scientific member-based organization. Uh, we're a professional association, a non-governmental organization. You may be familiar with Science Magazine, uh, which is published by AAAS. That publication supports the mission-driven programs at AAAS, including the program that I work in, uh, the Scientific Responsibility, Human Rights, and Law program. Other programs at AAAS promote science diplomacy, public policy informed by scientific evidence, uh, convene discussions around science and religion, encourage public engagement by scientists, and expand opportunities for people who historically have been marginalized in scientific education and careers. So this is the context in which our activities to promote scientific responsibility and applications of science and technology for human rights are grounded. We have uh, at AAAS, we have a growing portfolio of work on the societal impacts of artificial intelligence that crosses all of those programmatic areas. But today uh, for this discussion, I'll just focus on how we're approaching the opportunities and challenges of artificial intelligence for human rights. Our conceptual starting point for this, and it is for most of our work on science and human rights, is the right to enjoy the benefits of scientific progress and its applications. This right has long been underutilized, but it isn't new at all. It is uh, in Article 27 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and uh, explained in much more detail in Article 15 of the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. Earlier this year, the United Nations Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural, Cultural Rights uh, adopted General Comment 25, which details the state obligations regarding this right and the connections of science to other rights. This is an important document regarding states' obligations to respect, protect, and fulfill the right to science. And it couldn't have arrived at a more critical time. Uh, it addresses issues related to pandemics. Uh, it, it just, it, addresses issues related to climate justice, and it also specifically addresses 
um, artificial intelligence. There is language in the general comment that is is very clearly um, talking about the challenges and some of the things we were talking about this morning. Uh, and it provides some very practical guidance to uh, to governments on how to um, how what kinds of governance and protections need to be put in place within the human rights framework. So the headline obligation in this general comment is that states parties to the convention on economic, social, and cultural rights have to adopt policies and measures that expand the benefits of these new technologies while at the same time reducing their risks. The comment specifically says that states parties should develop mechanisms so that autonomous intelligence systems, that's the language in this part of the, the comment, are designed in ways that avoid discrimination, enable their decisions to be explained, and allow accountability for their use. In addition, it calls on states parties to establish a legal framework that imposes on non-state actors, such as large technology companies, a duty of human rights due diligence. The kinds of uh, impact assessments that uh, Dr. Bowser just discussed, for example. These mechanisms uh, that will guide the design of autonomous systems need to be informed by the five core elements of the right to science, which are availability, accessibility, quality, which is incredibly important to this particular discussion, acceptability, and freedom of scientific research. Now, sometimes people think that means un unfettered <laughs> freedom of scientific research, and that's absolutely not the case. Uh, it, importantly, it inf the, the freedom of scientific research also informs the limits of scientific freedom and the right to science. States have an obligation to encourage scientific ethics and to develop regulations consistent with the ethical responsibilities of scientists. So these five core elements of the right to science also intersect with cross-cutting human rights principles. These include non-discrimination in, uh, in science education, access to scientific information, participation in, in the governance of science and in discussions around the, uh, how science is used in other kinds of public uh, decisions. Transparency is, is an important uh, cross-cutting principle for the right to science and human dignity. So one way that the general comment illuminates how these principles intersect is by emphasizing the potential for new emerging technologies to expand the benefits of science to everyone. Again, it's the right to enjoy the benefits of scientific progress and its applications. The general comment recognizes the potential positive impacts of science and technology. Those are the benefits everyone has the right to enjoy. But it goes further stating a core obligation to, for governments to use science and technology to advance all of the state's human rights obligations. The core obligation includes, but is not limited to, uh, prioritizing public funding for research that addresses basic needs related to economic, social, and cultural rights, especially with regard to vulnerable and marginalized groups. That means that uh, there is not only an obligation to prevent harm from artificial intelligence technologies, prevent harm to human rights or human rights violations, but also to use artificial intelligence to improve the situation of disadvantaged and marginalized social groups, people with disabilities and persons living in poverty, among others. Uh, this has implications for the use of artificial intelligence in decisions regarding public benefits, uh, research to develop new medications and research that aims to provide more equitable access to food, uh, just as a few examples of ways that people are uh, looking at opportunities for using artificial intelligence to improve fundamental human rights. Another important cross-cutting principle is participation. 
everyone should have the opportunities to participate in research, to understand science that informs their decisions, uh, informed consent is an important concept here, and to also uh, to participate in public debate about science and technology. So um, this right here is part of that, I think, uh, this discussion. Transparency is absolutely essential to this kind of participation. Uh, the right to information is essential for this to be uh, a real meaningful uh, kind of participation. Participation and transparency are needed to ensure that new technologies that have implications to change social patterns and structures and maybe even to influence what it means to be human must be fully debated based on reliable information in order to develop sound policies that truly reflect the public understanding of the benefits and risks. On the topic of risks, um, the general comment connects participation to the precautionary principle. In the absence of scientific certainty, actions or policies that may lead to unacceptable harm should not be taken unless measures that avoid or diminish that harm are also taken. Uh, the precautionary principle is well established in environmental law, not quite as well established in human rights law, but uh, in this case, the uh, UN committee has, has made it very clear that they uh, it endorse the precautionary principle when thinking about the risks of new technologies. Um, the, the general comment says specifically that in controversial cases, participation and transparency become crucial because the risks and potential of some technical advances or some scientific research should be made public in order to enable society through informed, transparent, and participatory public deliberation to decide whether or not the risks are acceptable. This is where the core element of quality is so important because it informs our understanding of scientific certainty regarding a particular technology. Um, to better explain this, I could walk through, um, I, I had planned to walk through the use of facial technologies and biometric identification technologies. So thank you, Dr. Bowser for um, explaining that. So um, one of the problems there right now is quality. We, uh, it's not doing what it aims to do or purports to do. And that's um, one of the, the challenges with these new technologies. Uh, that has all kinds of impacts for public, um, for potential harms. We don't have scientific certainty about what the harms could be. Um, we know some, but there are also issues related to due process, um, the right to a legal remedy, non-discrimination, the kinds of bias that, that you discussed. Um, biometric technologies, though, also offer potential benefits to society, delivering public welfare services more efficiently, um, preventing violent crimes, providing more effective ways to support refugees who don't have other uh, forms of identification. These would be real benefits, but those potential harms have to be addressed before uh, we could move forward with that. And we need the transparent participatory approach to this. That includes bringing people who are underrepresented in designing the technology, making sure that they are part of building the technologies in ways that provide the benefits. Scientists have spoken up about, against the use of facial recognition by law enforcement. Um, Microsoft, Amazon, IBM have said they won't sell it to to law enforcement agencies. That's the kind of step we're talking about with these impact assessments and using a human rights-based approach. Um, so in conclusion, I just wanna say it's not all bad. <laughs> um, again, as uh, repeating Dr. Bowser, we need to look beyond bans to see how we can um, maximize these technologies to provide benefits to society and um, benefits and improve human rights overall. Um, that requires research and development funding for AI that addresses fundamental human needs and supports human dignity, inclusive public education about artificial intelligence. That's needed for full participation in artificial intelligence 
and applying the precautionary principle to limit the use of artificial intelligence in situations where it can cause unacceptable harms. Thank you. Oh, thank you. All right, that was uh, Theresa Harris. Thank you both from the US. Uh, now we're gonna move shift back to Europe. We have uh, Mr. Dr. Stefan Larson. So the floor is yours. Hi, thanks. I'm gonna see if I can uh, share a few slides. Um, probably stress out the tech team behind everything, but uh, we'll see if it works. Um, all right, thanks for inviting me, first of all. Uh, great talks before me. I, 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 uh, I have the honor to be in this group, actually. I think uh, you already made a great uh, uh, many points. I'm going to focus on um, sort of the mechanics of uh, implementing value-based governance of AI, in a sense. So that would be uh, the last few years, much talk on uh, guidelines, which is, you could describe it as a sort of soft law version of governance. Uh, of course, we're already have hard law in a sense. We have a whole range of uh, privacy regulations, particularly uh, emphasized in Europe, perhaps, as opposed to the US maybe, uh, but also anti-discriminatory regulation and stuff. But then there are fields that are not as clearly regulated, uh, which I think it's uh, particularly interesting to see how sort of the mode of governance is um, uh, developing. So I'm, I'm not normative in myself. I'm sort of looking from, from, from the side and see how this field is moving. Uh, and I, I do that as a social legal researcher, a, a lawyer and a sociologist, basically, uh, looking at new technologies. Uh, so some of the points uh, you've raised, um, I think that, like uh, Teresa said, it's not all bad. No, no, no. Of course not. Uh, and that's the tricky part, right? Uh, it's, it's always that battle with new technologies and all of the sort of challenging aspects of how do you, what aspects should be governed and could you, you should not, you cannot, you know, it's hard to anticipate regulation, right? It's hard to regulate beforehand. So, so it all, always has to be this sort of interplay between innovation and developments and then some sort of, you know, backlashes or pointing to stuff that went wrong. Um, so basically, uh, I'm going to mention, and I think you've already done that, uh, Anne and Theresa, the sort of the increased awareness in the field, uh, that there are challenges. We need to be much better at them, uh, particularly bias and, and accountability issues. And uh, as stressed a bit in the EU case, uh, the transparency issues. So how, how, who should be able to see, participate, and uh, have a say? And uh, how do we do detect when stuff goes wrong that are really complex. Um, briefly on the sort of guidelines, I, I call, it, call it a trend, uh, but, but then I, I, I focus on the EU because uh, um, we've just finished this um, anthology where we see sort of how the top level of EU is reflected at the member state level, because that's also one of the uh, challenging mechanisms in, in any sort of federated sort of uh, uh, countries uh, or, or regions. And in Europe, it, much of the policy have to uh, depend on national implementation. So that's a, that's the challenge. Uh, and it's not as easy to steer that sort of trend always. So anyways, the awareness, and I think we've already talked about it. It, it, it comes in many shapes and forms, but also sort of, which I want to stress, the, the engineering side of things, uh, seeing like the association on IEEE, seeing that, yeah, human rights should be on the table when we talk about uh, design that, that is uh, regarding autonomous technology. So, so you see some of the keywords in, in that pre nowadays early report uh, uh, targets human rights, but also transparency and accountability. And I, I also like, uh, like to stress that the traditional AI conferences that has you know, come from a more computer scientific perspective, more math, so to speak, they also acknowledge that, yeah, when we implement or use, uh, put these technologies in society, stuff happens. We need to we need to look at those things too. So that sort of the awareness building is is is, uh, is coming, and 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 that's good, uh, of course. So the ethics and society combined with sort of the computer scientific uh, knowledge, we see that in Europe, we see that in Sweden, we have a a big. Uh, program called the, the Wallenberg AI Autonomous Systems and Software Program, Humanities and Society. So that would be like the combination, the implementation, the, the application of technologies. And I think that's, um, 
that it sounds clear it sounds obvious in a sense but uh, when you look at how academia is structured it's it's not as easy as as one could think because also academia is uh, pretty sectored we have you know lawyers in one corner the economists in the other and then and then the the computer scientists in the third corner so so we never sort of not easily uh, find a common ground have just, you know create research projects in that field. So I think that's one of the things that, that has been begun to grow but, and it needs more uh, strength, I think, to understand these challenges and benefits. Um, this is another conference that's um, uh, sort of famous for it, uh, FAT, formerly known as the, now the ACM Conference on Fairness, Accountability and Transparency. So you see those terminologies. Now, if we look a little bit on the, the guidelines, um, when uh, the Berkman Klein Center just re pretty recently um, uh, released a report on, okay, what type of guidelines, what type of sort of principled AI um, is around? You see a whole range of um, um, pathways and a whole range of documents published uh, from you know Google and Microsoft and those types of companies, but also of course EU uh, high-level expert groups and and um, uh, also governments and and uh, like a uh, uh, Czech Republic strategy on uh, AI, for example. So the challenge though, uh, like um, uh, Jobin and, uh, and colleagues has stated is that when you look at these sort of uh, search or this trend of many different types of um, uh, high level principles, you see that, okay, there are a few concepts that are really at the core. So transparency tends to be mentioned and, and pointed to in, in most of them. And of course, justice and fairness um, uh, and, and, and that it should not be harmful. Uh, accountability and privacy, they are all sort of five cornerstones that you find in most sort of. The, the problem though is at that there, there is a divergence in how these principles are interpreted. So while the same concepts are used, they, not, they does not necessarily mean the same thing in all of these um, uh, different types of documents. And then the step would also be, how do you move from sort of the principle take where we sort of, many of us, many types of stakeholders can agree that, yeah, this is important. And then to sort of an implemented, the process of it, uh, which, which meets lots of challenges. Why maybe, and, and, and you, could, you could suspect that some entities or some companies prefer the the ethics guidelines before the regulatory methodologies because uh, uh, ethics is strong on principle but weak on process, right? It's hard to get um, um, uh, large fines from ethics principle. But uh, all of this is sort of the background to what's been going on in the EU, EU the last um, three years, I'd say. Um, uh, and I would mention particularly the high level expert group on AI, which is uh, an external body, but you know, appointed by the European Commission uh, with 52 members from uh, a whole range of fields, uh, different types of stakeholders, uh, everything from uh, companies to not NGOs to um, uh, computer scientists, lawyers and philosophers. Uh, uh, and they of course pointed to the fundamental rights sort of issue in it, uh, but then move to uh, different levels of what sort of principles should be included in the assessment and sort of development of AI. And they have different levels of, of which the highest level would be the four ethical principles of human autonomy, the respect for that, prevention of harm, the fairness and the, the explicability, which um, uh, could probably tr be trans uh, translated more to explainability and transparency or, or the, the ability to, to see what went wrong when something went wrong. Uh, that would be included in that. Uh, to be more sort of precise on methodologies, they, they moved on to the realization of trustworthy AI. So that would be, uh, okay, we've, we're going to impl implement and, and um, uh, assess or uh, ov overlook whatever syst AI systems we are using what are the main requirements? And then they focused human agency is at the core. So the human centric sort of part of, of design thinking, uh, but also robustness, privacy. Um, here is more uh, described as an ethics, uh, an aspect of uh, ethics, but of course, privacy and data 
data protection at least is very much uh, governed uh, and regulated. Transparency uh, is at the core, uh, the diversity issues, the non-discrimination that we've seen really good uh, examples from, uh, from Anne uh, on particularly facial, uh, facial recognition software. Um, those things should not, I mean, those should be detected if you follow this type of methodology. Uh, and then uh, to, to sum that up, societal and, and environmental well-being. I think we've been talking a little bit too, le too little about the environmental aspects of AI, uh, particularly if you compare it to, to the use of large, of, of big data, basically. That would be server infrastructures and lots of energy. Uh, those aspects, I think we could, we should stress them more uh, in, the, in, the, in, in the future. Um, accountability issues has, is um, uh, clearly central, uh, very much linked to transparency, I would say. So if something goes wrong, you should detect it. That links to pointing fingers, right? Um, um, and uh, they, um, I, like this, the word, I like to stress that this needs to be continuously evaluated. Uh, this uh, is a bit linking to Anne Bowser's, you mentioned the uh, impact assessment terminology. Uh, and, and I think this sort of assessment follows that type of uh, assessment uh, notions from primarily uh, environmental research earlier, uh, which um, Teresa also mentioned. Um, so when we looked at that sort of policy level, uh, it's one thing to state all these things with, uh, you know, bright minds. One thing, the other thing would be, how do you, where do you go from there? Uh, do you move into regulation? Um, and the EU Commission has proposed the white paper uh, pointing to some of the regulatory fields they see uh, uh, um, needs to be amended in the, in, in, in the near future. I'll have a last slide on that. But the other thing would also be the national, the member state level. Um, and we looked at nine uh, different uh, countries uh, and they obviously had a different, different takes on it, but some uh, and, and quite uh, the majority of them were influenced to the extent they had time to be influenced. So the timing, I wanted to show you the timing in this nice uh, little um, um, slide here because the commission and its high level expert moved over the years from 2018 and, and published sort of th these notions of human centric AI and trustworthy AI. Uh, but if you look at the member states and how they um, sort of developed um, uh, strategies, the early ones could not obviously be that much uh, influenced by the, the top level, but the later ones are much more influenced. So, so the notions of trustworthy AI, including things like transparency and accountability and human-centric uh, um, AI, are more clearly found in the, the later ones. Uh, like uh, you see it in the Italian, you see, uh, you see it in the Portuguese, and, uh, and the last draft policy in Poland also had clear sort of implications from, from clear sort of, yeah, um, inspiration from the EU level. Um, and then the last sort of slide then would be, okay, there are a few claims here made on European level um, where law, the sort of hard law is, may not be um, uh, complete or uh, very fit to, to tackle sort of the challenges with AI. One would be the, the, the transparency part. Uh, uh, some aspects in some markets or some economic sectors uh, that transparency needs to be stressed. And that could be, I like the ideas of uh, algorithmic impact assessment that was mentioned. Like you put more, more the more need, you know, higher stakes use of AI in, in fields that are really high stakes, then you should have more sort of demands on monitoring that and, and, and even a ban at the highest level, I guess. Um, then there are some regulatory issues with that uh, you have legislation that applies to products but not to services, which is a sort of a trend in, in development as well, and a challenge, obviously, then. Uh, and then the, um, the dynamic notion of uh, uh, AI systems that could be retrained on new data, that would be, that, that's also a challenge if you sell a system like that or, or sort of offer a service like that, and, and it's used and trained in a new context with new data. How do you regulate that? Who should, who should be accountable if it's shifting over time, right? So that would be my sort of quick overview of the uh, um, AI principles or AI uh, ethics as a tool for governance. And the, the questions that hangs in the area is, okay, what should be clear, more clearly regulated and what should be more sort of uh, 
uh, what methodologies and uh, assessment tools should be developed, uh, perhaps on uh, on a member state level in Europe? Then. Oh, thank you, Professor. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, to Professor Stefan Lawson. Next, uh, from India, we have Dr. Mark Chatsalipi. Floor is yours, sir. Thanks, Anas. Uh, it was a great insight from it started from Anne and Teresa and then Mr. Stephen. It was a, a great coming from US to uh, Europe. Now I'll take you to uh, India. And but before that, I'll just uh, give one. Uh, means like other side of the picture, especially from the uh, Czech Republic. You know, in, the, in 2015, in a rural part of Czech Republic, there was a school which had the Roma girls as their student. Uh, it was uh, uh, it's about 11 years old which, uh, from the Roma family, whose name was Dinka. And she was so bright and enthusiastic and that you could see from her eyes. But at the same time, there were obstacles she had to jump in order to get to the school. So in this case, let's remember that this is about Czech Republic, which is a part of European Union. And the case is not much old, just five years ago. More shocking was the sad fact that as soon as the group of Roma children had managed to get in the school, a lot of non-Roma children left because they did not want to be in the same school. So this, this story, I just gave the uh, scenario that, you know, it's uh, not uh, from other part of the world. This story is relevant because I do believe that AI is at a fork in the road that we have a clear choice in front of us. We want to be discussing these choices. One of the powerful concepts that uh, uh, Mahatma Gandhi had talked about, the concept of Antyodhya, which means the focusing on the benefits to the very last person in the society. When you have to make a difficult choices. You have to always, uh, you should always ask yourself what impact it has on the last person. So how could our decision on AI affect Dinka of Czech, Czech Republic or any young girl struggling in Afghanistan? So this is the something the background I wanted to tell that how it is going to affect it's good or bad AI. Could the development of new AI applications be threat to human rights? So these are the things that we have to uh, uh, discuss. Let's set our mind to think about what happens when the Dinka grows up. What happens when our children grow up and our grandchildren grow up? How will they judge us on what we did today and what we decided today? So this is all connected to our consequences and the human rights or the development what we are having around the world from Asia to America and from Europe to the Middle East. We are seeing what happens when inequality grows and is ignored, anger seems in the politics to blame and thrive, while the rights of the rights to pri uh, privacy and non-discrimination have dominated public discourse on AI. Today, I would like to focus on how many other human rights are also engaged both positively and negatively by AI technology, including other civil and political rights and economic and social and cultural rights. Government is also increasingly using the AI to support or make decisions, especially in the developing, uh, delivering services. AI is being used in a decision making where the potential impact for individuals is very high, including in relation to housing, health, criminal justice, and policing. In such contents, like uh, likelihood of engaging human rights and if poorly implemented, having an adverse effect on human rights is also very high. This is particularly evident in the digitization of essential government services. Everyone, including human rights defenders, are benefiting from the opportunities provided by digital technology to connect us faster and more effectively, while recognizing the important role that digitalization plays in a global economy and the fundamental principles of human rights must be at the center of discussion regarding the economic opportunities of digitization and must underpin and shape any regulatory framework put in place. Some may argue that the uh, that for business, what matters is the growth and profit, and that uh, that this has to be very uh, has to be their priority. But they can't complain about growing disillusionment and with the business and government societies must plan for mitigate against the risk. And this is particularly critical in the case of AI, which has the potential to create a huge economic disruption as economic inequality grows. 
there is another kind of technology fuel inequality that growing at exponential rate that relates to data. There is already a huge asymmetry in power between the companies and the sub government one, uh, on one hand and the individuals in society on the other as a result of the control that handful of the companies and the government exercise over the unimaginable amount of personal data. Whether it is to sell us ad for, uh, for electronic surveillance program or data gives formidable power to those who control it. We already know how data driven systems from financial to predictive policing applications can end up discriminating against the minorities and the poor people and what look it uh, like in 20 years of time if we talk 20 years ahead, what world do we want in uh, 2040? Technologies like artificial intelligence will shape tomorrow's world. That's certainty. I don't want to build a binary picture, but let's visualize the scenario. I'm just focusing on those connecting nodes that which will impact later on that when we'll be driving those technology in a different, uh, just focusing about the uh, results and not about the ethics side. The organization also wishes to draw attention to potential adverse human rights impacts relating to economic opportunities afforded by artificial intelligence. If human rights are not at the heart of the ethical and the policy discussion about how AI should be put at the service of humanity, then certainly we risk enriching global inequality on a scale where which will result in a massive political and the social appeal and disruption, the complete analysis of the aims of the 2030 agenda. So AI is already being used in some situation of uh, a special sector in healthcare, policing, and the criminal justice system. Within a generation, the use of AI will become much more widespread in many workplaces, in healthcare, in education, and across the public services, providing huge benefit to many, uh, not for all many across the globe, may also be see their jobs uh, disappear as the use of AI in workplace increases. So at the same time, there are some gaps which were noticed during the recent widespread protest. Racial inequality remains an urgent devastating issue around the world. And this is true. In fact, it may be more so algorithm technologies based on big data deployed the previously unimaginable scale reproducing discriminatory system that builds uh, and govern them. Similarly, in the context of coronavirus, the pandemic that what we are facing through, for example, the earlier reports have shown this disparate effects of the pandemic on the marginalized racial and ethnic groups, including because of the exclusion of this group from the benefits of emerging digital technologies, or because emerging technologies are deployed in a ways that put the groups in a greater risk of human rights violations. Notice any widespread perception of emerging digital technology as a neutral and objective in their operation and enjoyment of human rights in all the fields in which these technologies are now pervasive. Any human rights analysis of emerging digital technology must first grapple with the social, economic, and political forces that shape their design and use, and with the individual and the collective human interest and priority at play that contribute to the racially discriminatory and design and use of these technologies. The public perception of the technology tends to be that it is inherent and neutral and objective, and this presumption of technology object objectivity and neutrality is one of the remains the salient even among the producers of the technology, but technology is never neutral. It reflects the values and interests of those who influence it and design and use it, and is fundamentally shaped by the same structure inequality that operates in the society. Uh, in a 2019 uh, review uh, done by National Institute of Standard and Technology in US, 189 facial recognition algorithm from the 99 developers around the world found that many of these algorithms were 10 to 100 times more likely inaccurate in identifying a photograph of a black and East Asian face compared to the white one. So that in searching database to find a given face, most of them picked incorrect images among the black women and significantly higher rates than the, they could, uh, they did the, among the other demographics. There can be no longer any doubt that emerging de uh, digital technologies have a striking capacity to reproduce, reinforce, and even to exaggerate racial inequality within the within and across the societies. A number of important academic studies have shown concretely that design and use the technology are already having these precise effect across variety of contexts. Here indeed that among the biggest challenges addressing that uh, what we are the racially discriminatory use of the design and emerging technology are approaching approaches that 
treat this issue as a purely and largely technological problem for the computer scientists and other industry professor, professionals to solve the engineering bias-free data and algorithm. Technology is a product of society, its values and priorities, and even its inequities, including those related to racism and intolerance, technological determinism, and the idea that technology influences a society, but itself largely neutral and insulated from the social and the political economic forces only serves to shield the forces that shape the emerging digital technology and their effects uh, from uh, detection and the reform. Our reliance on the belief that technology can solve all the societal problems has a similar effect and can complicate integrating and changing the values and interests that shape the technology and technological outcomes. Although there remains a greater need for the scrutiny of, uh, of and accountability for the quality of engineering and ensuring equality and non-discrimination principles, securing these or other human rights principles must begin with the acknowledgement that the heart of the issue is political, social, economic one, and not solely technological or mathematical problem. Inequality and discrimination, even in those circumstances in which they are product of the design and use of emerging technology, will not be cured by more perfect modeling of equality and non-discrimination. So similarly, that uh, at the same time, and other side of uh, other side also that when we see the technical uh, technical advancement, other side the digital divides are also existing within the countries. For example, not that dominance of the United States uh, within the global digital economy, racial and the ethnic minorities in the country have desperate access to the benefit of the emerging digital technology. In many cases, they have. They are subject to the most significant human rights violations associated with the emerging technologies. According to the 2019 survey of Pew Research Center, black and Hispanic adults remain less likely to own a computer or have a high speed internet in home in the United States. While 82% of the world's reports owning a desktop or laptop computer, only 58% of the blacks and 57% of the Hispanics do. Substantial racial and ethnic differences in the broadband adoption also exist, with the world's being 13 to 18% more likely to report having the broadband connection at home than blacks and Hispanics. The digital divide along with the access uh, of race and ethnicity is significant. In the case of China, if we consider that there are se severe human rights consequences of its design and use of emerging technologies and has been noticed. These concerns are further amplified by the growing influence of Chinese emerging the digital technology in the global south. Estimates in Canada also show that approximately half of the predominantly indigenous uh, northern population lack the high speed of connections available to their southern counterparts. Indigenous digital inclusion have also been low in Australia, especially outside cities, with only 6% of the residents in some of the remote aboriginal communities having the computer. So with the respect to the right to work in uh, one of the study in equal rights uh, of equal rights it was found that Parag paraguay and uh, had implemented a digital employment system that allowed employers to sort and filter the prospective employees by various categories some of which served the proxies for race furthermore the system is only available in spanish when less than half of the rural indigenous people in paraguay uh, speaks Spanish. Such limited language accessibility effectively restricts the system's availability to the job seekers of an ethnic biases, even if this is not the intention of the policymakers. So similarly, that in uh, other cases, the, uh, introduc uh, the introduction of the automated system that do not rely directly on the discriminatory inputs or the processes that can nonetheless indirectly discriminate against the marginalized groups in their uh, in the uh, access to work by reducing the eliminating available positions according to the one uh, according to the report of apc association of progressive communication in 2019 a new artificial intelligence based project that would eliminate the need of many jobs typically uh, performed by these in the lowest or dalit or dalit caste dalit especially the women can often only find employment in the sanitation sector and some indian states have prioritize the list for the sanitation jobs. Implementation of a smart sanitation systems would likely affect the job and livelihood of the Dalits uh, dis uh, disproportionately, especially Dalit women. 
in light to the broader socio economic and political marginalization of dalits in india automation in the sanitation sectors might fundamentally undercut the access to work for those who rely on employment in the sanitation sector so emerging technologies also have a discriminatory impact on the right to health the top tier healthcare algorithm in the united states market use patients past medical cost to predict the future cost which are used as a proxy for healthcare dates emerging digital technologies have also have a discriminatory impact on the right to health another example of the united states in uh, another uh, recent case study examined a predictive model developed by epic system corporation the leading global developer of uh, electronic health records integrated directly to the existing electronic health records and this epic artificial intelligence tool estimates that likelihood that a patient will no show by using the patient's personal information including ethnicity class religion body mass index as well as the index record of prior no shows in pointing out the obvious potential to discriminate against the vulnerable patient population the expert note that removing sensitive personal characteristics from a model is incomplete approach to removing bias 2019 multiple states including bangladesh drc congo egypt india iran and uh, sudan myanmar and zimbabwe completely restricted the internet access to a specific region with the effect of preventing nearly all the communication in and out of those region researchers have also linked more targeted internet and shutdowns to the reasons a higher uh, distance to the minority groups so in in this way uh, uh, many states uh, that, are, that are experimenting and incorporating emerging digital technology in their own welfare systems in a way that reinforces the racial and discriminatory structure australia has implemented online uh, compliance intervention systems commonly known as robodep this automated decision making system uses machine learning algorithm to identify suspects over payments of the government and welfare benefits demands documentation and those recipients marked as a received and more than they are entitled to the uh, welfare payments so this kind of emerging digital technology poses a mammoth regulatory and governance challenge from the human rights perspective in many cases the data codes and system responsible for discriminatory and the related outcomes are complex and shielded from the scrutiny including the content by intellectual property and law in some contexts not even the computer programmers may themselves be able to explain the way that their algorithm system functions to overcome these challenges uh, state must take a swift swift uh, effective action to prevent the mitigate the risk of the racial discriminatory use of design and the em emerging digital technologies including by making racial inequalities uh, based on the such technology and the public authorities but uh, after hearing this uh, uh, we can just uh, can we uh, ask ourselves can we do much better when a states sign the uh, union declaration of human rights in 1948 they were not simply reflecting the world they lived in but an aspirational world a world which uh, which would stand for and protect every human being's dignity we must today challenge ourselves to be aspirational again as we prepare for a future world where ai and technology are integrated to every aspects of people lives so this is uh, my uh, take this was my take that about the good or bad how this ai should influence us or how far we can go and adopt this kind of thing so this was all with examples and from across the world and we have to think again being a human right activist i just uh, focused mainly on the examples and the uh, uh, means like connection between the technology and the human rights and the daily the societal challenges and all so so thank you so much i'll just over to anas Yeah, thank you, Dr. Shahid. Uh, very well point. Um, and last, uh, not least, is uh, Doman Savage. Hello. Um, thank you all for uh, inviting me to this panel. I'll um, keep my presentation short. Um, it's basically a um, comparison between practice and theory when we come to um, the field of artificial intelligence, digital society, and uh, other aspects. And uh, I'm going to focus on the development and the implementation of the COVID app in uh, Slovenia. Um, this has been a very interesting procedure where you had two elements of um, 
of um, basic development. So on one hand, you had the, the techno-deterministic side where the general uh, solution or the general suggestion was that, you know, this app will basically solve the, the COVID crisis on its own. You just have to download it, install it and keep your, the phone in your pocket. And on the other side, you had a very weird legal implementation of the said app, which was um, very confusing in terms that uh, Slovenia passed a law that made the COVID app uh, obligatory. But at the same time, um, the government said that it will not actually enforce this law unless it's deemed necessary by the government. So you had a problem of uh, joining together a legal framework that is actually in power, but it's not being used. And on the other side, you had uh, an, um, an optional app, the COVID uh, tracing app with you, you know, sort of like a government threat that if this isn't, uh, if this isn't used, like we're telling you to use it, uh, we're gonna make it obligatory. Um, this opens up or this, this um, problem or this issue can be applied to, to other uh, artificial intelligence uh, areas as well, where you have on one side the theoretical concepts that are mostly focusing on the all-encompassing AI trying to take over the world. Uh, and then um, you can compare the, the actual implementation of, of uh, the set principles in practice where you can see that uh, it's not going to be as big or as uh, omnipotent as, as promised, but at the same time, it's gonna cause problems where you have, as I said before, legal framework that is saying one thing and then practical solutions that are saying uh, completely something completely different. Um, before I, I give the floor to, to questions and, and debates, I would just like to, to emphasize that the problems of AI shouldn't be focused solely on um, the difference or the issue of uh, technology versus transparency versus, uh, versus openness, but we should also focus on the, on the issue of, of responsibility. Um, we see that currently in Slovenia, the, the COVID app and the whole failure of government management of, of the COVID pandemic uh, can be traced back to, to the issue of responsibility, right? The government is now using the failure to implement app or the, the, to, to, um, to encourage users to, to use the app. Not many people in Slovenia are using it. As, a, as an excuse for the entire government strategy of fighting the COVID-19 to, to, uh, to fail. So um, in, 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 regard, in seeing or taking that aspect or taking this issue to, to a more broader AI uh, concept, I would warn against, as I said before, the problem of using AI to, um, to sort of reject any responsibility be it by the government, by the private sector, by the legal entities, in saying, you know, oh no, 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 that's AI. We have we we don't have anything to do with this. This is just, you know, there's multiple uh, multiple sides to blame, but we're not one of them. Uh, this is important because, as I said, it's not uh, it's not being addressed enough, and uh, it's a very delicate, albeit a bit boring subject. Uh, which which needs uh, further emphasis, especially as we progress and the AI and other technologies are are being you know installed in in different uh, in different uh, aspects of our of our public and private lives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Noma. Uh, I don't know if we have enough time for questions, but I do actually have some for those across in the US regarding uh, to Anne and Teresa, if I may. Um, the, the EU has a GDPR and other countries are following suit. Uh, even China, for instance, uh, copying some aspects of GDPR. Does the US have plans for adopting something similar, uh, equivalent na nationwide? I know there's sparsely ones located uh, on state levels. Is there a nationwide plan for protecting data? 
So it's a female. Um, there are certainly pushes from different sectors for that. Um, there, I'm not aware of a plan, but that's also a little bit outside of what I work on because my work is more um, internationally focused. Uh, I, I know that the projects at NIST um, are, is, there are some that are working toward that, but um, I'm not sure exactly what the status of them would be right now. Okay, thank you. Is there anything you'd like to add, Aunt, Dr. Ann Bowser? Yeah, from my perspective, so we have the Privacy Act of 1974, which is obviously from 1974, and that's foundational, but a bit outdated, and that is looking across federal agencies. In addition, the U.S. approach to regulation generally targets domains differently, and this is true in all emerging technologies. So HIPAA, for example, regulates privacy in the health and medical space but does not extend to other areas. And I see the US likely continuing that approach. Part of the issue here is also, as Teresa mentioned, the multi-sector question and the fact that a lot of privacy concerns related to data are related to the private sector. And I don't think we have an effective framework that is established or under consideration for contending with those types of activities. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I think we're running out of time. It's the last stepped over. I'd like to thank all our speakers and viewers for participating with, uh, with us today in today's event, uh, the right to be human in the age of AI, uh, those from the US as well as in India and those of us here in Europe. Um, to continue following with the series, you can join us uh, this coming December 3rd uh, for Human Rights is Equal to Human Rights. Uh, about the event, it's uh, women achieved, by the early 19th century, women achieved uh, legal equality, can vote and be elected, or can be a CEO of an enterprise. However, they're equal to men. And are they, And if they are not, how can they step up in their rights and equal to men in modern society? So that will be held together in part with the human rights in the 21st century project. And I believe that will conclude our presentation for today for the right to be human in the age of AI. Again, thank you all for the speakers for joining us, as well as the institutes that hosted the event. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. So, thanks to everybody. Anas, thank you. Thank um, you, Sebastian, of course. Uh, I, I, actually, I was watching it and... Uh...